just introduce uh, uh, my dear friend uh, William Dalrymple, who needs, of course, no introduction. Uh, he is a writer and historian. Uh, his interests include the history and art of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Middle East, the Muslim world, Hinduism, Buddhism, the Jains, and early Eastern Christianity. Is there anything left for the rest of us? Uh, his latest book is uh, The Anarchy, India Between Empires, 1739-1803. And other titles uh, uh, that uh, I'm sure you know, uh, coming from his pen, are From the Holy Mountain, A Journey Among the Christians on, uh, of the Middle East, Nine Lives in Search of the Sacred in Modern India, and uh, The Marvelous Return of a King, The Battle of, Af of Afghanistan, which landed him uh, giving a briefing to uh, uh, the White House, the former White House, and uh, discovering, uh, discovering that uh, our very intelligent intelligence service uh, uh, guys were totally ignorant about hi the history they were repeating. Uh, Darlene Poole is also co-founder and co-director of the annual Jaipur Literary Festival. And today, he's here to talk about uh, one of the first, of the first in many first things. The first multinational, the original raider, one of the first uh, uh, Indian words to enter the English uh, language. Uh, from the Hindustani. The Hindustani is slang word for plunder, loot. That is to say, uh, uh, the way in which our very world was born. Let me welcome uh, William to deliver a dazzling lecture on the East India Company, two different sides of it. Let us call them, call them light and darkness. No apologies to George Lucas. I've been writing lately uh, about the East India Company, um, which is an extraordinary story. People still talk about the British conquering India. It wasn't the British. It was much worse. It was the world's first great multinational corporation. And these are important distinctions in the age of our friend Trump. Uh, the East India Company is... Imagine Walmart with nuclear submarines or uh, Facebook with fighter jets. Uh, it was the world's most heavily militarized multinational. By the peak of its power in about 1800, uh, it had a private security force that was twice the size of the British Army. Uh, and in as little as 40 years, this corporation run as recently as the 1760s from a single office building in London with only 35 permanent staff. Uh, uh, an office block five windows wide, not much larger than this tent, uh, conquered the whole of the Mughal Empire, which at that point controlled about 40% of the world's GDP. It's one of the most astonishing stories in world history. And the Victorians queered the pitch for us by making us think of it in uh, nationalistic terms as the British against the Indians. As soon as you realize that it's a corporation with shareholders and that many of those shareholders are Marwari moneylenders, the whole picture changes dramatically. And it actually becomes a story about corporate influence and the battle between a corporation and the battle between the state. And at different points in the East India Company's story, the company battles the state successfully. For example, it's within only 30 years of the founding of this first multinational corporation that there is the first parliamentary inquiry into the company corrupting parliament by bribing MPs. By the 1760s, that isn't even necessary for them to corrupt anyone because I can't remember how many, I think it's 65% of MPs own shares in the East India Company, so stand to, uh, to gain from it. And history suddenly looks, it's like putting on sort of Polaroid, one of those, you know, those three-dimensional glasses you get at movies. Suddenly, everything slightly changes when you see it through a corporate lens. And I'll just read a little bit um, to give you an idea of the, the scale of this story. Could we have the, we have the first slide. One of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the Hindustani slang for plunder, loot. 
According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word was rarely heard outside the plains of North India until the late 18th century, when it suddenly became a very common term in Britain. A visit to Powys Castle on the Anglo-Welsh marches is a good way to understand why and how this world took root and flourished in so very different a landscape. For Powys is simply a wash with loot from India. Room after room is filled with raw imperial plunder extracted by the East India Company in the 18th century. Indeed, there are more Mughal treasures stacked here in a private house in the rolling Welsh countryside than are on display in any one place in India itself. Hookers of burnished gold inlaid with empurpled ebony, superbly inscribed spinels and jeweled daggers, gleaming rubies the colour of pigeon's blood and scatterings of lizard green emeralds. There are talwars set with yellow topaz, ornaments of jade and ivory, silken hangings, statues of Hindu gods, and coats of Mughal elephant armor. Such is the overpowering dazzle of these treasures that as a visitor last summer, I nearly missed this image in front of you, which explains how it all came to be here in the Welsh countryside. The picture hangs in the shadows at the top of a dark oak panelled staircase. And it certainly isn't a masterpiece, but it does repay close study. In the centre, an effete looking Indian prince wearing gorgeous cloth of gold sits high on his throne under a silken canopy. On his left stand scimitar and spear wielding officers of his own army, while to his right, a group of powdered and periwigged Georgian gentlemen are waiting to tr transact some business with him. The prince is eagerly thrusting a scroll into the hands of a statesmanlike, slightly overweight Englishman in a red frock coat. It is August 1765, and the young Mughal emperor Shah Alam, exiled from Delhi and recently defeated by the East India Company at the Battle of Buxa, has been forced to perform an act of involuntary privatization. The scroll in his hands is an order issued in his name to dismiss all the existing Mughal revenue officials of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, and replace them with a set of English traders appointed by Robert Clive, the new governor of Bengal, and the directors of the East India Company. Henceforth, the collecting of Mughal taxes will now be subcontracted to a powerful multinational corporation, with all its revenue collecting operations protected by its own private security force, its own G4S. This is the moment that the East India Company moved from being a relatively conventional corporation, trading in spices and silks, to become something much odder. Within a few years, 250 East India Company clerks, backed by a military force of 20,000 locally recruited Indian soldiers, had become the effective rulers of Bengal. So it was that the company began to morph from an international trading corporation into a private, aggressive corp uh, colonial power. Using its rapidly growing security force from 800 guards in the 1730s, the company's army grew to 30,000 by 1765 and 260,000 by 1803. It swiftly succeeded in subduing and seizing an entire subcontinent. Astonishingly, this process took less than half a century. The first serial, serious territorial conquest began in Bengal in 1765. By 1803, only 47 years later, the company had reached as far north as the Mughal capital of Delhi. And almost India south of that city was now ruled from a boardroom in the city of London. What honor is left to us? Asked a Mughal official named Narayan Singh shortly after 1765 when we have to take orders from a handful of traders who have not yet learnt to wash their bottoms.
We still talk about the British conquering India, but that phrase disguises a more sinister reality. It was not the British government that seized India at the end of the 18th century, but a dangerously unregulated private company run in India by an unstable sociopath, Clive, and headquartered in London out of one small office, occupying 200 yards of city street frontage. In many ways, the company was a model of corporate efficiency. 100 years into its history, it still just employed 35 staff in its head office in London. Nevertheless, it was from that small office and that skeleton staff that a corporate coup unparalleled in history was masterminded. The military conquest, subjugation, and plunder of vast tracts of Southern Asia. It remains probably the supreme act of corporate violence in world history. For all the power wielded today by the lights of Facebook, Google, and Halliburton, they are tame beasts compared to the ravaging territorial appetites of the militarized East India Company. When it suited the company, it made much of its legal separation from government. It argued forcefully and successfully that the document signed by Shah Alam in this picture, the Diwani, was the legal property of the directors of the company, not the Crown even though its government had spent a massive sum of around £8 million on naval and military operations to protect the company's territorial acquisitions in India during the Seven Years' War. But the MPs who voted to upheld, uphold this legal distinction were not exactly neutral. About 23% of them in 1760 grew to about 65% uh, 20 years later, held East India Company stocks, which would have plummeted in value or become worthless had the Crown taken over its acquisitions. For the same reason, the need to protect the company from foreign competition became a major aim of British foreign policy. There is nothing new in foreign policy being heavily influenced by the lobbying of corporate interests. Western-backed coups in Mossadegh's Iran to protect what became BP or IND's Chile to protect ITT form close parallels with the sort of actions that Britain took to protect its company in the 18th century. From the beginning, company and parliament covered for each other in a corrupt symbiosis. The transaction depicted in this painting was to have catastrophic consequences for that part of Eastern India that had its revenue collecting privatized and outsourced. With all such corporations then and now, the company was answerable only to its shareholders. With no stake in the just governance of the region or its long-term well-being, the company's rule quickly turned into a straightforward plunder of Bengal and the rapid transfer westwards of its wealth. Before long, Bengal, already devastated by war, was struck down by famine, then further ruined by taxation. A senior official of the old Mughal regime described in his diaries the piles of dead bodies and fires sweeping through tinder-dry houses and granaries. Pensioners of the old regime, he wrote, in these hard times have not a single resource under the canopy of Hindustani heaven. East India Company tax collectors were guilty of what we would today describe as war crimes. Indians, quote, were tortured to disclose their treasure. Cities, towns, and villages ransacked. Jagirs and provinces purloined. These were the delights and the religions of the directors and their servants. This process of extracting gold bullion, known as pagodas, was referred to by young company traders as shaking the pagoda tree. Throughout the 1770s, Bengal's wealth drained rapidly into British bank accounts while its prosperous weavers and artisans were coerced, like so many slaves, by their new masters, and its markets flooded by British products. As the 18th century historian Alexander Dow put it at the time, previously, quote, the balance of trade was against all nations in favor of Bengal. It was the sink where gold and silver disappeared without the least prospect of return. Bengal was one of the richest, most populous, best cultivated kingdoms in the world. And we may date the commencement of its decline from the day it fell under the dominion of foreigners. Much of the loot of Bengal went directly into Clive's pocket. In 
He returned to England with a massive personal fortune, then valued at £234,000, that made him the richest self-made man in Europe. The Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, George Soros, and Mark Zuckerberg of the 18th century all rolled into one. Hyper-aggressive plutocrat. After one single back battle, Plassey, a victory that owed more to treachery, forged contracts, bankers, and bribes than military prowess, he transferred to the company treasury no less than 2.5 million seized from the defeated Nawabs of Bengal. In today's currency, that represented about 23 million for Clive and 250 million for the company. There was no great sophistication in its transfer. It was merely loaded, the gold was loaded into flat-bottomed boats and floated down the Hooghly to Fort William in Calcutta, thence to Powys in Wales. The company, however, like all such companies, despite gaining such extraordinary wealth, was also surprisingly vulnerable. Like more recent mega corporations, the company proved at once hugely powerful and yet vulnerable to economic uncertainty. Only seven years after this picture was painted and the Diwani was granted, the company's share price had doubled overnight after it acquired the wealth of Bengal. But the speculative East India Company bubble burst equally spectacularly. The company was left with debts of 1.5 million and a bill of 1 million unpaid tax owed to the Crown. When it became known to the public, 30 banks collapsed like dominoes across Europe, bringing trade to a standstill. In a scene that's horribly familiar to us today, this hyper-aggressive corporation had to come clean and meekly apply for a massive government bailout. On the 15th of July, 1772, the, companies of, uh, the directors of the company applied to the Bank of England for a loan of £400,000. A fortnight later, they returned, asking for an additional £300,000. The bank could raise only £200,000. By August, the directors were telling the government, in confidence, that they would actually need an unprecedented bailout of a further £1 million. This is all in 18th century money. You could add many noughts to it today. The official report the following year, written by Edmund Burke, foresaw that the company's financial problems could potentially, quote, like a millstone, drag down the government into an unfathomable abyss. This cursed company would at last, like a viper, be the destruction of the company which fostered it at its bosom. But unlike Lehman Brothers, the East India Company really was too big to fail. So it was that by 1773, the world's first aggressive multinational corporation was saved by history's first mega bailout. In the first example of a nation state extracting as its price for saving a failing corporation, the right to regulate it and severely rein it in. Today, we are back in a world that will be familiar to those early British traders in India. Because today, the wealth of the West has begun again to drain eastwards, in the way it did from the Roman times until the birth of the company. When a British prime minister, or indeed a French president, visits India, he no longer comes like Clive at Allahabad to dictate the terms. In fact, negotiation of any kind has passed from the agenda. Like Roe, he comes as a supplicant. He or she, as the case now be with Theresa May, comes as a supplicant, desperately begging for business. And with her comes the CEO of the country's biggest corporations. For the corporation, a revolutionary European invention that dated from the same time as the beginnings of European colonialism, and which was one of the institutions which gave India, uh, so gave Europe its competitive edge throughout the Raj, has continued to thrive long after the collapse of European imperialism. When historians discuss the legacy of British colonialism in India, they usually mention democracy, the rule of law, railways, tea, and cricket. Yet the idea of a joint stock corporation is arguably Britain's most important export to India, and one which has, for better or worse, changed South Asia more than any other European idea. It's certainly more powerful than the idea of communism or Protestant Christianity, and possibly more than democracy itself. Companies and corporations now occupy the time and energy of more Indians than any other institution other than the family. 
They also hold more power across the globe. As Ira Jackson, former director of the Center of Business and Government at Harvard's Kennedy Business School, recently noted, corporations and their leaders have today, quote, displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and oligarchs of our system. Covertly, companies still govern the lives of a significant proportion of the human race. American figures show that in the 1780s, only 20% of Americans received a corporate monthly paycheck. That figure has now risen to a peak of 80% in 1980, at which point it came slowly to decline again. The mass protests seen in many capitals over the last decade against the World Trade Organization and the way it has allegedly enhanced the ability of large corporations to evade the authority and tax regimes of governments shows that the 300-year-old question of how to cope with the power and perils of large multinational corporations remains today without a clear answer. It was not clear, it is not clear still, how a nation state can adequately protect itself and its citizens from corporate excesses and corporate violence. As the international subprime bubble and bank collapses of 2007 to 9 have so recently demonstrated, just as corporations can shape the destiny of nations, they can also still drag down the economies of entire nations. In all, US and European banks lost more than $1 trillion on toxic assets from January 2007 to September 2009. What Burke feared the company would do to England in 1772 actually happened in Iceland in 2008, when the systemic collapse of three of the country's major privately owned banks due to the subprime meltdown brought the country to the brink of complete bankruptcy. Corporate influence with its fatal mix of power, money, and unaccountability, is particularly potent and dangerous in frail states, where corporations are insufficiently or ineffectually regulated, and where the purchasing power of a large company can outbid or overwhelm an underfunded government, as would seem to have happened uh, in, in, under the last Congress government in India. Yet, as we've seen so frequently in the West, corporations can still successfully buy the media in advanced Western democracies too. And the nexus between business and politics is as tight as it has ever been. The East India Company no longer exists and it has thankfully no modern equivalent. Walmart, which is currently the world's largest corporation in terms of revenue terms, does not number among its assets fleets of nuclear powered aircraft carriers. Neither do Microsoft or News Inc or Google or even Halliburton possess regiments of infantry or squadrons of bombers. Yet the East India Company, the first great multinational corporation, as well as the first to run amok, was the ultimate model for many of today's joint stock corporations and remains history's most terrifying warning about the massive potential for abuse that corporate power brings. Sadly, the issues that the history of the company raises about the relationship between corporate power and the power of the nation state and the ability of a rich and predatory corporation to evade the authority of a government and to corrupt or overwhelm the state have never been more current. I'm just going to end by, though, Oscar promised that I would show some lighter sides of the East India Company. And given that it's an art fair, the, the art of the company tells a slightly different story, and one uh, that we could maybe end with. We have about 10 more minutes? Yep, five minutes. So the Mughal Empire, at its peak, ruled all of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, a slither of Iran, uh, and uh, was, along with Ming China, one of the two richest polities in the world. Between them, in the 1780s, they controlled about 75% of the world's GDP. Uh, what happens is that when this collapses, this leaves the vacuum which pulls in this corporation and allows this corporation to take over. But history is never simple. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about what happens in Delhi when the East India Company takes it in 1803. This man, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor, uh, is ruling, shown here uh, in, the, in the wonderful company school paintings of Ghulam Ali Khan. Zafar is a poet. These are his poetic notebooks. You can see 
even if you can't read the Urdu, uh, you can see how he's filling the, the gutters and the every corners of his notebooks with these verses, just pouring out. He's, he wrote poetry in five different languages. He was a calligrapher. This is his work. But when the British turn up, they turn up in their red coats, and you might expect the normal um, uh, expected colonial uh, form to uh, the British remaining apart, keeping separate. What's interesting in the case of Delhi and the Mughals is so attractive is the Mughal culture, so strong is its poetic uh, and artistic forms, that it overwhelms the British. And for a brief period, you have as if the current of colonization is reversed. Uh, and the opposite to what you expect happens. Here is Octoloni when he arrives. A, a, a Scot who'd already fled America at the revolution comes to India. Look what happens when he arrives in Delhi. Within 20, uh, within 20 months, he's dressed in kurta pajamas, looking as if he's attending some wonderful Dubai Indian wedding. Uh, he's got his dancing girls in front of him. Um, a suitable way of depicting a man who famously had no less than uh, 13 Indian wives, each of whom had her own elephant. Uh, and every evening they would do this wonderful loop around the red fort. Uh, he has his, his personal eunuch carrying a, a fly whisk behind him. He's got his dancing girls. And best of all, he's got his outraged Scottish cousins peering down from the curtain rails, uh, from the picture rails, wondering what's happened to Ur Devi after a few years in the Indian capital. And you can see these sort of hooded and plumed Highland colonels on the top left, these stiff taffeta-clad Bostonian women. Uh, because Octoloni totally went over to Mughal culture. This was his seal. He took his, his title, Nazir ud uh, There is actually a town in Rajasthan called Nazirabad that not many people is, is actually named after a Scotsman. Uh, and uh, as a, a measure uh, of the surprise of this period, this is the tomb that he's built. If you look carefully, you can see very clearly that there are uh, a wonderful forest of minarets and timurid domes left and right. What you don't see until you peer more carefully is that in the middle is a dome based on the dome of Brunelleschi's uh, Duomo in Florence with a cross on top, possibly the only building in the world uh, ever to combine the cross and the minaret on a single uh, structure. And this was built for his chief wife, Mubarak Begum. It's called Mubarak Bagh. It was the last of the great Mughal gardens built by a Bostonian Scot. Um, around him, he collected this group of like-minded early company officials. This is a, a character called William Fraser, a descendant, a, a forebear of my wife. And you can see this sort of slightly cocky British public school boy with a kind of slight sneer on his face uh, uh, and an, an air of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of self-possession. But look what happens to him when he arrives in Calcutta. He's still, he's still wearing his Scottish hat on his head. Uh, but watch the moustaches in the next few pictures. Uh, this is him in a sort of Tarun Tahiliani wedding outfit or a Rohit Baal uh, sort of lovely kit. Uh, here he is. The, the, keep watching the moustaches as, as the thing goes forward. Uh, and this is very interesting because this was a man who, who married a, a Harry Anvi beauty. These are his two sons who had these double identities. They were known both as Issa Khan. Uh, and, uh, and James Fraser, depending on whether they were in their Harry Anvi village or applying for a job in the East India Company. These two kids left and right. And these are all William Fraser's brother-in-laws behind. Uh, here's his, his wife to the, to the right, brother-in-law to the left, son in the middle. Uh, and uh, Fraser and Octoloni and Skinner developed a new form of art in his company school painting today. Uh, this is the Delhi kind of version of it. Using mogul painters, painting with that exquisite mogul detail, um, but uh, uh, with um, uh, using European watercolors on European watercolor paper. And this, to me, is a very interesting sort of world. It shows how things are always more complicated than you look from the, the macro picture down to the micro, and there are always exceptions. This is uh, the, the, the William Fraser's Afghan business partners. He used to uh, uh, buy in... Um, uh, horses from Afghanistan. And um, at this period, one in three British men in India is leaving all their goods to Indian women in their, in their wills. There is a surprising degree of, uh, of, of, it's probably too much to call it multiculturalism, but certainly there were mixed households where people are making sort of choices that any mixed couple today would make. Do you sit at a table or do you eat on, or do you sit on the floor? Do you eat with your hands or do you use cutlery? Uh, do you wear Western clothes or Eastern clothes? And the answer is that most people did a bit of both. 
Um, and Fraser commissions this extraordinary set of images from these Mughal artists, known today as the Fraser Album. Uh, and one of the great, it is the last great masterpiece of Mughal painting, commissioned by a Scot using the imperial court artist. This is one of his uh, manservants, a man called Kala, seen on the left as he came in from the fields of Haryan, uh, Haryana uh, in his dhoti, um, with his slightly sort of raggedy turban. Uh, having looks if like he's just harvested his fields. And this is him dressed up as William Fraser's Jamadar uh, on the right, same guy, uh, with the Fraser uh, her heraldic uh, heart's head on his chest. This kind of mock Napoleonic outfit. Fraser's great friend was James Skinner, who found Skinner's horse. He's half, again, half Scottish, half Raj Rajput. Um, and this is, this is Skinner's horse, this extraordinary mixture of worlds coming together. Uh, but it's a, it's a dark story. This is uh, a company which by the 1820s is making most of its money from selling opium to the Chinese. This is an opium den in Delhi, a company uh, monopoly, and these guys are coming in to drink bung. So a complicated story, uh, but one that ends very unhappily uh, with, in 1857. Uh, this man, Zafar, is on the throne wearing uh, his spectacular collection of headwear. Um, when on the 11th of May, 1857, the uh, sepoys ride in uh, and begin what will become the first war of independence. Zafa uh, is arrested at the end of it and sent off to die in exile in Burma. Thank you very much.